All right, in this lesson, we are going to give you an introduction to the bank reconciliation process. The bank reconciliation process is one of those processes that we use as an internal control for cash. Now, companies often do the bank reconciliation as part of their monthly close uh, that corresponds with the receipt of the bank statement that they get from their bank. So this is a great way to make sure that all the cash that is deposited is in the bank and all the cash that is spent is reconciled to the book. So at the end of the day, we are reconciling the cash to make sure that every transaction that we think should be in the bank statement is in the bank statement and then it also gives us an opportunity to make sure all of the transactions that's on the bank statement is what we would expect on our books now in addition it also provides us information and the ability to do a journal entry for those transactions that we didn't know about especially if it's on the bank statement and not on our books like interest revenue that the bank's going to pay us or maybe there was a non-sufficient funds check uh, that we didn't know about it bounced so when we try to cash it it bounce and it could even be a situation where we receive revenues uh, that are deposited directly to our bank through an EDI system but we didn't really know about it and so we need to reconcile that so every month companies will do this bank reconciliation as tedious as it might be because it's an important factor in the internal controls of cash so let's get started with the introduction of the bank reconciliation a bank reconciliation is a process of using the company's books and the bank statement from the company's bank and comparing each to ensure all transactions are properly reconciled to each other. That's our goal is making sure that basically both sets of books, the bank's books and ours books are reconciled to each other and they pretty much are the same thing. Now, a bank reconciliation is an internal control, like I stated at the very beginning, which uses a couple of things. It uses a segregation of duty because the persons or the people that are dealing with the cash ins and outs are typically not the one that are uh, reconciling the bank statement and the bank reconciliation. Uh, it uses independent verification because a third person is going to independently verify that all the transactions are good. It provides documentation in the form of the bank reconciliation. It's a document that you're going to learn how to do in the next lesson. And then it can establish responsibility because we're telling one person that they are responsible for reconciling the bank statement. In order to do a bank statement, we've got seven steps for you. Now we're gonna kind of describe all the seven steps here in this lesson and in the next lesson, we're actually gonna do a problem in which we're gonna go over those seven steps individually. So this is kind of a preview of the example that we're gonna see in the next lesson. So let's start with step number one in the bank reconciliation. We're gonna report the balance at the end of the period on the bank side and the book side of the appropriate column. So what we're gonna basically do is we're gonna get the numbers from the bank statement that would be the bank number and then we're going to get the numbers from our books that's going to be the book number and we're going to start with the ending balance now typically when we look at both of those ending balances they are not going to be the same and so we're going to have to adjust or reconcile it so that at the end of the bank reconciliation process they are both equal to each other moving on to step number two of a bank reconciliation any outstanding checks are known by the company so uh, when a company writes the checks they know that the check has been written but not the bank adjust the bank balance down for any outstanding checks this step may require you to verify which checks are on both statements so a couple of things here in step number two we know that we wrote a check for let's say a thousand dollars so we've already taken that off our general ledger balance so our balance includes that thousand dollar check well, if that check hasn't been cashed or hasn't cleared our bank account, our bank account's going to seem like there's a thousand dollars more in our bank account. And so in order to do the bank reconciliation, we're going to remove that thousand dollars from the bank's ending total balance to get it to what it should be should that check have actually cleared during the month so that's what we're trying to do here now in parentheses this note about we're going to maybe have to look at different 
uh, both statements and then reconcile the checks. What that means basically is if we have to take it a little bit further, what we're going to do actually is we're going to look at our general ledger and we're going to see all of the checks and then we're going to get the bank statement with all of the checks and all of the amounts. And what we're going to do is we're going to cross off the ones that are on both statements. At the end of doing that on the banks, on the general ledger, anyone that you haven't crossed off those are your outstanding checks and those are the checks that need to be adjusted of the bank balance. So um, that's what that means there. Now moving on to step number three, any deposits and transits are known by the company but not by the bank. So we're going to adjust the bank balance up for any deposits in transit and again we may have to verify that as well. So a deposit in transit is a situation in which the company deposits, it, deposits money with the bank but the bank hasn't counted it or posted to the customer's account. Now you might go, well, when would that situation actually happen? Well, a lot of companies have what they call overnight drop boxes. So for instance, let's say um, a, a, a Taco Bell, for instance, collects cash today. And then tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. when the manager comes in, they count the cash from the previous day. And then they take that cash to the bank using their overnight drop box. Now, if you've never seen an overnight drop box, you can go to most banks. You're seeing less and less of them, but if you go to some banks, on the wall of the exterior of the building, you might see this big like lock box, and sometimes it looks like one of those pull down things where you kind of put things and you close it and then it drops into the building. That's a drop box. So, Taco Bell will count the cash and then maybe their manager takes that cash to a lockbox, which the Taco Bell manager has a key to, will open up the lockbox, put the money in, and then drop it in the bank. Then uh, the bank will need to count that. Now, theoretically, they should count it that day, but if it is a Sunday, the bank's not going to count it until open business on Monday. So that is called a deposit in transit. The deposit is making its way to the bank and it hasn't been counted at the bank just yet. So in those cases, the company knows about the deposit, but the bank doesn't. So the bank balance at the end of the period doesn't have that deposit yet. So in step number three, we're going to add that deposit in transit to the bank balance to get to what the bank balance should be when the bank learns about that deposit. Now, step number four here, any non-sufficient funds uh, checks are known by the bank. They process, uh, they process the company's deposit and that check, but not by the company. So we're going to adjust the bank balance down for any non-sufficient funds known by the bank. Non-sufficient funds is basically a balance check. And so this scenario is a company deposits a check into their account. Now, because of just how checks work, usually it takes 24 to 48 hours before your bank realizes that the check is no good. Why? Because when you deposit a check, that check information has to go to the check writer's bank. And if it's a different bank, then that bank is gonna have to tell the depositor's bank, hey, the person who wrote the check doesn't have any enough enough money in their account so we can't pay you. That's a non-sufficient fund. There isn't sufficient funds to pay on that check. So in this case, who knows about it? Well, the bank knows about it because they're the ones that are getting the notification from the check writer's bank that the check is no good, but who doesn't know about it? The company that deposited the check doesn't know about it. So if there is a non-sufficient funds check, the bank balance has been adjusted because the bank knows about it, so they're gonna take that money right out of your account right away. But the books might not show that you have a non-sufficient funds check because the company does not know about it. So if there is a non-sufficient fund, we're gonna to need to adjust the company's books down because the company does not have the money any longer since the check bounced and is no good. So that is step number four. Moving on to step number five here, any interest earned is known by the bank. They paid the interest to the company and therefore um, not known by the company. So the company is going to have to adjust their books by adding some money to their cash account for the amount of the interest revenue. Moving on to step number six, any errors or adjustments 
left will need to be adjusted based on the context of the error. So you have to read the context of the error. And then from there, you'll need to decide whether it's going to go on the bank side or the book side. And then is it going to be plus or minus. So that's one's a little bit tougher and we're going to go through an example and I'll explain it step by step here in step number six. In step number six, seven, we're going to add or subtract all of the columns down uh, that we made adjustments to based on steps one through six. And hopefully at the end of the bank reconciliation, they should equal out. So that's our goal here. They should equal out after we've done all of our adjustments. So our goal, we want to make sure all the transactions that the bank knows are about are reflected in our books. And we also want to ensure that all transactions the bank has are appropriate to our approval process. We know that it's appropriate to our approval process when our general ledger has that transaction in our books. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in our books if it wasn't approved. So that's kind of what we're trying to do at the end of the bank reconciliation. So that is an introduction to the bank reconciliation. In the next lesson, we're actually going to do a bank reconciliation. So we're going to walk you step by step with an example and help you understand how we actually prepare that bank rec. So hope you enjoyed this lesson and we'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, it is Patrick. Don't forget to press the like button and share this video with someone who could get a lot of you from watching this lesson like maybe a classmate or maybe a friend or maybe just a parent just because you wanted to share this video because you're very excited about what you saw share it with someone and if you want to help us grow and help us make sure that we put the very best in accounting topics out on YouTube make sure you press the subscribe button and turn on that notification bell that way you're alerted every time we post videos to this channel now I do this with every one of my classes at the end of class. What did you learn from this lesson? Put that in the comment section below and I'll respond to you on what you got out of this video. So hope you enjoyed this video and we will see you in the next lesson.